There's not one person that I've come across who's told me that it's not the best wild game they've ever had in their entire life. This is something that I would love to see every single guy that hunts to do it, whether they're a Western hunter or an Eastern hunter. It took me a lot of years with a company trying to master the recipe correctly. Actually, it took about three years of sampling and bottling and sampling. A lot of people, they're just so wrapped up in the idea of doing it themselves that they're either afraid to ask for help or not willing to ask for help and accept help. When you can serve somebody wild game that's better than anything they've ever had in their life and change their opinion about hunting and what it actually brings to the table is amazing. This is Andy Mokel, the flip-flop guy, and you are listening to The Wild Initiative. Put down your latte and pull on your boots. Our culture needs people that are leaders and not people that are waiting for somebody else to show them how to do it. Those fields of tofu, that was formerly habitat for wildlife. You're killing off wildlife by being a vegetarian just as much as a hunter when he kills a deer. I'm like, well, you see that bush right there? (laughs) There's your bathroom. (laughs) My dad wears a Levi jacket. He sits in front of a sagebrush and he tells me the best camo is hold still. Not to Donnie Vincent this, but be relentless in everything you do. Don't crap out. Go back to the truck with excuses or whatever. Okay, assume I get a deer. How do I cut it up to fit into a Honda Civic? Just get outside. Just get outside and go. Because once you do, it's all gravy from there. Hey, this is Zach Griffith. This is Hannah Barron. This is Jason Phelps of Phelps Game Calls. Hey, guys, this is Cody Rich from the Rich Outdoors podcast. What's up, guys? This is Chad Mendez. You're listening to The Wild Initiative. Hey, y'all, welcome to another episode of The Wild Initiative, brought to you as part of the Waypoint Outdoor Collective. All right, y'all, so on today's podcast... I feel like this one has been about four years in the making. Like, could be about that long. It it feels like <laughs> feels like we've kind of been like, yeah, we need to do a podcast for a long time, and it's just and it and it takes both of us moving to Montana to finally make that happen. Yeah, getting the fuck out of California. Oh, do you swear on this? Is that okay? Well, we do now. Oh. You know, it's fine. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> ever, ever since I had Aaron Snyder and Frank Peralta on one time, uh-huh. like I just did, I kind of gave up on, on that. <laughs> Monitoring. <laughs> I, I, used to, I used to censor it, um, censor, censor him now and again mm-hmm. with the, the whole bleeps and everything. And then I'm like, what's the point? <laughs> I did a podcast episode where I had to go through and bleep out a lot of it because... <laughs> It was like a blacked out barbecue (laughs) party. (laughs) And that was interesting. That was interesting. There was a lot of things that were said that (laughs) were not supposed to be public information. You get a knock at the door. Uh, Excuse me, um, (laughs) Mr. Mm Mockle. Mockle. Did I say Mockle? You did. I'm going to screw that up like 80 times. It's okay, dude. Everybody's not perfect. Mockle. Mockle. I mean, I strive for perfection, though. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, I should probably introduce my guest if oh, you hey. do not recognize those dulcet tones. <laughs> from, You're out of control. From the Flip Flop Guy. Is it officially the Flip Flop Guy podcast now? Uh, yeah. The, so the podcast is actually, um, I cut it off in January or whenever I ran my last episode. I've got like a, a bank of episodes that I'm sitting on that are yet to be released. Uh, and we've talked about this actually a couple of times. Mm-hmm. I got to go through, you know, take off the and the intros and outros of every episode that was recorded, which is like 160 something episodes and uh, re-record the intro and the outro and uh, redo everything and get it all underneath yeah. one roof just because running multiple businesses. I mean, I barely have time to run my own business, <laughs> let alone try to run multiples these days so yeah it's it, i feel like when you when you add one more business it's not twice the work it's like if you, somehow it feels like yeah. triple the work and for sure and especially with a business like what i'm doing the flip-flop guy selling sauces and and the whole deal is it's a lot more time consuming than just running a couple podcast episodes a month and everything yeah. like that there's a lot more involved in it um on the back end well, the business. And, and especially when you are also the face of it, you're the flip flop guy. I am. It's like, you know, if I, yeah. if, if my ass showed up and started flipping a deer leg, people would be like, what the hell, homie? Yeah. Like, I mean, no, but like I encourage everybody. <laughs> I mean, this is not just something that my family does this for me. This is something that I would love to see every single guy that hunts 
mm-hmm. to do it, whether they're a Western hunter or, or an Eastern hunter. Um, I mean, at Sorenex this year, we did nine white tail legs that I'm pretty sure were killed out of a, a deer stand or out of a tree stand in uh, South Carolina. And one of the most beautiful things about that was 150 people from all walks of life and every single person there had hands-on experience. You know, we did 10 groups of 15 or something like that. I can't remember the actual numbers because I don't pay attention, but <laughs> you know, and, and every single person there got to flip and flop and marinate and salt and pepper and slice and feed people and watching a group of 150 people come together and be able to do that with each other is so great. And the inspiration for them, some of them, you know, people who haven't hunted or, or who haven't uh, killed an animal yet, they're so much more excited now because they get to take that home to their backyard barbecue and share that with their family and their friends, you know, and this is something that my grandfather started doing in the late 1950s, early 1960s in West Marin and to watch it blossom so much further than, Marin County, California is absolutely just heartwarming for me and my parents and, and everybody involved, my whole family and, you know, other people who have done flip flops in West Marin and stuff like that. Everybody's just getting to watch this whole, you know, family legacy get passed along to the masses. And it's so rad. It's going from like a, there's a small, like family, you know, personal Function. group legacy yeah. now to being like a, a kind of cultural thing in and of its own right. Like 100%. And people will tell me like, uh, I was, I was with some guys over at stone glacier this morning and, uh, just talking with them. I was talking to Andrew over there. Great guy. Absolutely great guy. And, uh, he was, he, <laughs> he was like, you know, everybody knows you, everybody knows what you do. And I was like, for me and, and, um, it's really hard to wrap my head around that you know, the amount of people that actually have seen it, want to try it, do it, are doing it, you know, uh, nationally and internationally, Canada, you know, and, mm-hmm. and other places. Um, it's, it's, I don't, I don't, I, I haven't processed it yet. I'm still <laughs> in the processing phase of it. It's kind of crazy. No, man, it's awesome. And I, I just remember, you know, when we first started talking, you're like, yeah, man, you got to come down. We'll do a flip flop. And I'm like, the fuck is a flip flop? Whatever the fuck that is. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, sure, bro. Yeah. And I think the first one I officially did, though, was at Western Hunting Summit last year. Yeah, last summer. In yeah. June, I think June. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. it would have been June. And I just remember rolling up. You know, we'd been cooking with Birch Barrel like for a couple of days. Yeah, Brendan Burns donated us. It was a, yeah. it was a big, it was, I want to say it was a 21 pound whitetail leg monster leg. I mean, usually oh, it's huge, usually with any hind quarter and, and for anybody who's listening that may end up wanting to try this cooking method, um, you can't use front shoulders. Just don't. Um, but you use the back legs, the hams. And usually, I mean, a good leg is 18 to 20 pounds. Like that's a really good leg. Uh, usually they're between 15 and 17 pounds and then black tails are anywhere from like 12 to 16 pounds. Um, you know, but getting a whatever, you know, that leg was massive. Oh, it was huge. And, we fa- and so many people got to try it and got to eat it, and everybody loved it, you know. It's a pretty remarkable experience. I had so much fun. Those guys were just awesome, the Western Hunting Summit whole crew that was there, and their speakers and educators that they had that came along to help teach the event. And, uh, yeah, it was just a great experience. Yeah. No, it's exciting. It's, you know, it's coming up. Uh, i got to look at the dates, like. It's coming it up maybe, at the end of the month, I think. Well, or like uh, two weeks. It, it may be, I think, next weekend. Oh, cool. I think that uh, that it's... Um, I'll have to look at the dates because there's three of them again. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, it's coming up. It's like the last three weekends of the month. So I think it's it's coming right up. But uh, but so uh, everybody that's listening uh, that, that has not seen or been to one is probably like, well... What is a flip-flop? What the, what the hell is a flip-flop? You guys are sounding like children here. <laughs> you want me to break it down? Yeah, let's break it down. Okay, so the flip-flop is, the. I mean, and I'm really not trying to toot my own horn or, or my grandfather's horn here. It is the best way that you could possibly eat any wild game that's an ungulate, any animal that doesn't carry trigonosis. Um, and the reason why I say that is because I don't want someone to go kill a bear and be like, I'm going to do the flip-flop method <laughs> and end up getting trigonosis and calling me and being like, what the fuck? Calling you from the toilet. Yeah. You Damn know. you. Yeah, me. right? Like, 
you know, so I'm very clear, you know, off of an ungulate. And uh, for me in the field, right, what I'll do is I'll do a cut around the knee, you know, just below the tendon, a little bit below the knee, maybe like a half an inch below the knee. And I'll either break it or I'll get my saw and I'll, I'll saw the bone because there's no joint where I'm cutting. Um, and then I'll skin all the way down on the inside of the leg, you know, to the pelvis. And I'll skin out all the way around that rear hindquarter. And then I'll lay the animal on its back and I'll push the leg, you know, whether, you know, the left leg or the right leg out to the left or out to the right. And I'll push it back and I'll just start cutting it, you know, ground quartering it out. Um, and uh, so you get in there, you'll get into the ball joint, you'll cut around the ball joint and then cut all the way down and around and as close to the um, spinal cord as you can. And then you just pop that whole leg off. And, you know, then you have this whole single piece of meat and it has a handle on it and everything. Um, and I'll, if I'm freezing it, I'll just wrap it really tightly with saran wrap and then put butcher paper around it, tape it up and throw it in the freezer as is the day I'm going to cook. I'll take it out 24 hours before, depending on temperatures and everything like that. It takes about 24 hours for a leg to fully thaw. Um, and I'll go through the leg and I'll cut silver skin or, you know, the aged, the aged skin off. I don't know why that tongue twisted me. <laughs> I'll cut the aged skin off and um, I'll lay it out, you know, I'll let it come up to room temperature. I'll usually put it out two or three hours before everybody can walk by and see it. Everybody that sees it most of the time, no one's ever had it because no one's ever seen this style of cooking before. And, um, you know, maybe 30 minutes before I throw it on the grill, um, I take a bunch of sprigs of rosemary, you know, about 15 to 18 inches long. And I tie wire them, zip tie, electric tape, whatever you have to use to make a brush. And I make a mop that's probably, you know, three inches in diameter, four inches in diameter. And uh, I take, so the, the recipe is obviously a family secret. Um, it was gifted to me on my 25th birthday by my dad. And it was gifted to my dad by my grandfather oh, wow. on my mother's side. So I'll take the marinade. I've... Obviously, it's www.theflipflopguy.co. You can go there. You can buy the marinade. Um, it's extremely thick. It's very concentrated. It took me a lot of years with a company trying to master the recipe correctly. Actually, it took about three years of sampling and bottling and sampling until I was like, all right, you're going to have to hand fill every single bottle and send me a hand filled bottle according to the recipe. And they did. And it came out perfect. The problem with the vat mixing was that it couldn't mix everything in it properly because it's, it's just too, too thick. thick. It's oh. too thick. There's too much going on in it. You know what I mean? That To get that robust flavor that's in there, it's just, you know, it's too much um, for, a, for a machine to do it. Um, so you take two bottles of sauce, and I like to say every single bottle is worth two bottles, right? So you take two bottles of sauce, and I'll usually find – a cab or a Zin, uh, preferably I use seven deadly Zins. It's what I've used forever. It's a very nice Zinfandel. Um, and I'll fill, after I dump the sauce into a bowl, I'll fill the sauce bottles up and I'll shake it up, you know, make sure I get all of the contents out of that bottle and into that bowl. Pour the wine in, get my rosemary mop, mix it up a little bit, and then I have a rosemary infused olive oil that's also available on the website. And I'll pour, you know, about a quarter or a half bottle of that in there just to, you know, add that extra olive oil, extra, extra virgin olive oil flavor in there. And I'll mop the top of the leg, you know, whatever side is up. Doesn't matter if it's the ball joint or just the beautiful ham. Uh, I'll mop that. I'll throw some salt and pepper on there and uh, throw that side face down on the grill. Now, the grill, the biggest thing that I found in... Uh, my buddy, Robbie Doctor, he's been doing it over wood fire and, and stuff like that, which has been awesome. He's been doing, like, these crazy techniques. Like, <laughs> he'll smoke a leg for, like, 12 hours, and then he'll flip-flop the leg. Ooh. Absolutely amazing Ooh. to see, you know? Because uh, that's something that I've never – I'm just so used to doing it, you know, the traditional way that we've always done it. It's so cool to watch people, you know, come up with these new techniques and new ways to do it. Anyways uh, – you know, you, you'll get a charcoal grill and I like to keep my coal bed like two to three inches below the leg. 
And I use it when the coal's at their peak height, like flames still kind of coming out of them. I don't wait until the flames are gone. Um, so the, the grill's scorching around 1,100 degrees. It's really hot. Uh, so I'll put that sauced side down, and then I'll grab my mop and my bowl, and I'll mop the top side that's face up that has nothing on it. I'll salt and pepper it. And by the time I'm done with that, the other side is already cooked, right? So what you're doing is you're getting an extremely hot sear on that underside piece of meat. You flip it. You start searing the other side. Go through, and I use a brisket knife. A 14-inch blade is what I like. Plus, the, you know, and then you get a, it's got like another five inches for the handle. Helps keep your hand away from the heat. Mm-hmm. The brisket slicer is by far the best knife that I have used to slice off of a, off of a leg. I've used so many different knives over the years. Brisket slicer is hands down the best. And uh, you just slice off thin quarter inch thick pieces of meat, you know, and you can cut them into eight inch long quarter inch thick steaks, or you can cut them into little you know, five inch, four inch pieces or whatever. And for me, usually I'll have a a tub with buttered bread, buttered sourdough bread and just slice it off, put it on the bread and serve it to the person that's standing next to the grill and they walk off and the next person walks up. Um, Traditionally at home when we do them, I mean, like, you know, we've got mountains of abalone going and Mm -hmm. salmon and, you know, elk burgers and you name it, we've got it cooking. Um, just because this is all the stuff that we killed and this is how we share yeah. it with, you know, 50, 60, 70 people. Um, so anyways, you, you cut your slice off, put it on the bread. And once you clean that whole top side off of all of its cooked meat and it's just back down to raw meat again, marinate it, salt and pepper it and flop it. Right. And just flip flop. And one of the most beautiful parts about it, like I've had people that are trying it and they're like, I'm so nervous. I'm, you know, I just don't have the confidence really to do it. And I'm like, look, dude, you got 30 or 40 flips and flops. <laughs> and every time you flip and you flop it, you got a whole new piece to start over, right? So every time you do one, you have 30 or 40 tries to get it right, you know, and then increase it by continuing to do it. Um, I'd say the hardest thing is some folks have, you know, haven't been successful in the field yet. They haven't killed something. Um, which I'm working on a remedy for right now. Uh, soon enough, I will have USDA approved wild game flip flops available on my website for purchase nice. for anybody that wants to buy one because I want everybody to be able to have the experience. Well, I'll tell you one of the cool things like that I loved is I feel like when we did a Western hunting summit, it was more like chilling in the backyard with family. Mm-hmm. Like it wasn't like, quite as structured of an event. And so everyone was just kind of, we, there's a couple of barrels going with some other food, but everyone was just kind of hanging around. I remember like, you'd be talking, you'd be having a conversation. All of a sudden there'd be like a brisket slicer with a piece, a hunk of meat hanging from it in front of your face. And you're like, hello. (laughs) Yes, I will eat that. And it's just like, yeah, it just magically freaking you and your magic carpet freaking making shit appear in front of people. Right. Well, and, and that's actually something that's really crazy about experiencing what happens at a flip flop is there is some sort of magic in the air that unfurls with everybody, you know? You're so poetic. I don't know if it's from (laughs) whatever. (laughs) I don't know if, I don't know if, if it's from, there's this huge chunk of meat on an open fire and it's just getting cooked and cooked and you're eating it straight off of the bone. And, you know, I, I couldn't tell you the exact recipe that makes it so amazing, but There's definitely something there that brings to the table an experience that, you know, outside of Marin County for the last 70, 80 years, there's really no, you know, Mm -hmm. there's nobody that's ever experienced that style of. It's that sense of interactivity for one, Mm -hmm. like even if you're not there like doing the actual brushing and slicing yourself, you feel like you're still part of it. You, you are know, part of it because you're picking the, yeah. the, the meat off the knife blade. Like, you know, that's how I was serving it there. I'm pretty sure. Um, or you're, or you're taking the slice that's still sizzling hot mm-hmm. off of the grill, you know, on a piece of French bread. And it's, the meat is so hot. It's rare underneath, but it's still so hot that it's melting the butter into the bread and you take a bite and it's just like, it's primo. It is primo. And, <laughs> There's yeah. not one person that I've come across who's 
you know, told me that it's not the best wild game they've ever had in their entire life. And they have no idea how they've never thought to do that. And they also have no idea how they're, you know, they're never going to get rid of another hind quarter. They're going to keep at least one hind quarter off yep. of every animal that they kill for the rest of their life to be able to do that and share it with their friends. And that for me is what it's all about, you know, and it's passing along that tradition and, and that family history into every hunter's backyard across this planet, if it's possible. Which I've got a, I've got a whitetail hind quarter. It's, uh, it's, it's aged, um, but it's been in the freezer and, uh, the oldest a, leg I've ever cooked was like 13 years old. I don't think that you're going <laughs> to, and, think it, it'll be and fine. it still was dynamite. Yeah. Like there was absolutely nothing wrong. You thought that it was killed the day before. I've got to, I've just got to make sure it's not freezer burned. I just want to take a look at it. Well, see the but, beauty is if it's freezer burned, you're cutting off the top quarter inch of meat anyways. So it doesn't really yeah, matter. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I'll have to, yeah, I'm going to have to pull that out. Take a, take a look at it. Um, that would, that would have been from when I was in Missouri, like a year and a half ago, two mm -hmm. years ago, something like that. That's um, cool. Yeah. One of the guys got a white tail and he was going to donate the meat and I'm like, well, my freezer's empty. You can donate that to me. I'll fly at home. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'll have to, uh, fire up the birch barrel and, and make an attempt. I, the other thing is too, I'm making knives now mm -hmm. and I'm like, I'm going to make my, I was, I, oh, that's I was right. Like, I saw you were like forging or some shit yeah. in your garage maybe or, yeah. 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 And so I'm like, I've, I've, you know what? I kind of want to make my own like custom brisket slicer for the, uh, mm -hmm. for the, for doing that. I mean, good luck. <laughs> I've had a lot of custom knife makers try. Just it's, never it's quite. very difficult. You need a really thin piece of steel. Yeah. And you have to get it right. Yeah. Well, yeah, you got to get that. I mean, you got to get that edge, really that edge geometry. Perfect. Like yeah. cooking, like cooking knives, kitchen knives, like, Dude, I, you know, you can make a chopper, freaking camp knife, bushcraft knife all day long. It doesn't take a lot of, I mean, yeah, and somebody's going to take a lot of it. This. It takes a lot of experience to make those kind of knives. Too. I mean, yeah, it takes a lot of experience, yeah. but you can, you can make a functional one a lot easier than you can make a fun, a basic functional actual cutlery. kitchen cutlery yeah. because it's a lot of, a lot of those, the edge geometry is so fine and you have to get those really perfect kind of curves in to get, so the meat doesn't stick to it. And, mm -hmm. um, there's a, there's a lot to those things, but that's, oh, yeah. that's kind of a, a goal is I'd like go to go for it. Make I'd one, like dude, that'd be rad. Make an attempt and yeah, you should give it a little, a little wide. And head. then when you cook your own flip flops, you've you got, you've got a knife that you made, which adds to your story behind, exactly. you know, I mean, one of the most beautiful things about cooking these legs for folks, you know, and especially at, we just did soar next summer strong. Um, and I cooked up two elk legs from a cow that I had killed two years prior, which I could tell the story about that hunt. That was a fun hunt, but, uh, we cooked just over a hundred pounds of elk. So getting to share the story of the hunt, you know, which was, I ended up killing that cow on day nine after passing several bulls that just didn't meet my standard of bull that I was looking for. You know, I wasn't meat hunting a bull. I was definitely looking for, you know, yeah. targeted mature bull. Um, I was really trying to find like some 70 or 80 pound legs if it was possible. Nice. Uh, and you're only going to find that on a mature animal. Uh, so I ended up shooting this cow and her legs were, you know, I think one was like 51 and some odd quarters. And the other one was 52 and a quarter or something like that. But, uh. I ended up shooting her on day nine and for everybody that hunts, you know, don't shoot a cow on day nine. If you want to kill a big bull, um, <laughs> that's, you know, that's, <laughs> that's the best thing I can say about that. So I cut this whole cow up. Um, I packed out neck meat, I, you know, I processed everything, boned everything out except for the hams loaded up my backpack and it was a seven and a half mile pack out. I packed the entire cow out in in one one grunt and uh, i tied both hams off to my hip belt and you know there's a foot and a half of snow on the ground so i was dragging that in mm -hmm. the snow i was plowing and uh got out got back to my truck it was funny there was a guy pulled up to the trailhead and he was like oh wow did you get something i was like yeah 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 
And he's like, oh, could I help you at all? And I was like, yeah, if you could drive my backpack to my truck, which was 300 yards, because I was done. Yeah. Like, when this guy pulled up, I had collapsed into a snowbank. Like, I was destroyed. And um, he was like, sure. And he went to grab my backpack, thinking it was going to just be like a heave and a 70 hoe. 70 pounds or something. You know, and he, and he grabbed my backpack and fell into the snow. <laughs> it was actually, it was pretty neat to see. But um, anyways... Got in my truck and, you know, went to where I glass from. And sure enough, out came 300 cows and eight bulls that were all, Jeez. you know, in the range of bulls that I was looking for. And I was just like, don't shoot a cow one day night. Actually, a buddy of mine made that very clear to me at a dinner that we were having one night. But that's a different story. Oh, man. Jeez, I can't imagine. I mean... Yeah, you know, it's a cow, but still. That that's... was actually the, that was a hunt where I had texted you and said, I'm sitting on a bull. Come to me and you can shoot. It was a five by four or something like I that. I don't think I ever got that text. Because you were somewhere else. Yeah, I was kind of up towards else. the snowies. Yeah. Um, I don't think I ever got that text. Because you had mentioned, you had hint, you had alluded to that before when we were talking. And I'm like, did I? I I was sitting on bulls every yeah. day, just not the ones I wanted to well, shoot. Well, and that's, and that's like, because I remember you saying like, um, like, I think the last text I'd gotten from you was like, hey, yeah, we're going up, da-da-da-da-da or something, mm -hmm. and yeah, we'll be in town. And I'm like, oh, you know, and then then later you're like, yeah, man, I told you you could come shoot something with me, da -da -da. and I'm like, I, I never got that. Yeah. I never got that text, so yeah. I think I just totally... Either I spaced on it or it didn't go through or whatever. You know, yeah. I mean, you know how it is going yeah. in and out of the mountains. I get it. Um, I totally get it. Uh, kicking myself now for that for 2019, but yeah. I did get, I finally got my first bowl. Yeah. Last year that, in Arizona. Yep. That was yep. cool. This last season. Uh, yeah, you and uh, John. John. Yeah, that was. Uh, John's a great guy, man. I love that he's guy. He's just good people. No, mm -hmm. no bullshit. Like he'll, he'll tell you exactly what he's thinking. Every, you never have to worry if oh, he's yeah. like. If he's being honest with you. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, yeah, it's funny. You know, it's like I always, I always love it because, you know, he's a, he was my guide, but he's a buddy too. So he's a little more casual with me than he would be with normal client. I mean, there's so many, he'd turn around and be like, what is your effing problem? Mm -hmm. He's like, do you just want to kick every rock like an asshole or what? <laughs> yeah. Calling you out. And like me, I'm like, I thought I was being really quiet. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> not so much. Um, I learned a lot on that trip, man. Just like, you know, cause my past three trips have effectively been solo. Mm -hmm. Um, so much, so much. Shit well, I think that there's a lot to be said for, um, relatively new hunters getting into the field. And I know like a lot of folks want to take a lot of pride in going out and doing it solo and, you know, really getting it done, you know, but the, the thing is, is that when we watch these people on social media that are having constant success and having, you know, constant kills, you know, at almost every tag they get, you're looking at a person who's so experienced, they can look at dirt where it looks like there's been no animals, but you can still find the tracks, you mm -hmm. know, and, and for people to try and go out and do it solo without a guide or without a mentor uh, I think is a terrible mistake for new hunters because there's, you know, for me, I grew up, you know, my dad showing me, my grandfather showing me, my mom being able to show me, you know, like people my whole life being able to show me what to look for, what not to look for, you know what I mean? And, and all that kind of stuff. And I think a lot of people, you know, throw, sell themselves short, I guess. Because they're not, they're so, and I'm not saying this is your case, but a lot of people, they're just so wrapped up in the idea of doing it themselves that they're either afraid to ask for help or not willing to ask for help and, and accept help. Because I mean, and a lot of it is men and, and as men, do we really ever want to ask for help? No, yeah. not really. Yeah. I mean, our ego and our pride is way too big, you know, like smash that shit. You're in the fucking woods. Animals will kill you. You, anything can happen at any time where you can get stuck out there. Like learning it with a mentor, I think is the most important part. And there's so many state programs where people can find it, you know, and, mm -hmm. and you don't have, I mean, if someone can't afford a guide, contact a local warden, contact your local department of fish and wildlife, fish and game, whatever, 
and find someone because they'll be able to, to guide you and direct you to a mentor as a hunter's education instructor for the state of California for, you know, the last seven or eight years, like getting to mentor new hunters all the time was one of the coolest things. So I guarantee you in every state, you know, uh, a wildlife officer is going to be able to put you in contact with someone who is going to be able to mentor and, and help and take you out, you know, and, and do those things. They probably not going to show you their spots or their honey holes. You know, they might say, let's look at some maps and come up with what you think is going to be good and let's go there and mm-hmm. I'll help you. And, you know, there's so many different avenues instead of, you know, the new way of doing it. Well, I'm glad you brought up the, uh, the hunter's education instruction and things like that, because that's something I wanted to ask you about. And Mm -hmm. that's, I feel like there is such, and I've talked about this on a recent podcast too. I feel like, I feel like there is, has been such a gap when it comes to hunter education Mm -hmm. to where there's, it's like, it's the old boys club and there's not a lot of young, fresh blood going in and volunteering to teach hunter's education. It's Um, changing. I mean, I, 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 I can tell you, and I can only speak for California, but in my time working with California and, and what they have going on out there, uh, I never had a bad experience with a warden, you know, through the hunter's education system. Mm-hmm. I never had a bad experience with new hunters through the hunter's education system. Um, there's a lot more younger blood getting involved. Uh, I think personally, and this is just personal opinions, everyone's got one. It's like an asshole. Mm. Um, I think that there's so much drive on social media these days for people to profit off of new hunters instead of passing along the tradition. Uh, a lot of people are, are profiting off of the lack of knowledge. And I mean, you know, sure, it's this is America. Fucking make money any way you can. You know what I mean? And if, yeah. if you find a niche doing that, like, that's cool, you know. Um, but I think that... <laughs> it takes away from mentorship and it takes away from a lot of places where you can go and get free help. You know, like you've been to the California advanced hunters education for turkeys. Yep. Um, and you got to experience that. And I'm sure you were able to retain a lot of knowledge from that event with a lot of other new hunters and learn and understand stuff from people that are way more educated and, and way more knowledgeable in that field. Um, and You know, the Advanced Hunters Education Program, I'm pretty sure, is in every single state across America. You know, I think there's a lot of lack of information out there. Um, And I think also people don't want to promote it because they would rather, you know, find a group and and charge people for it. Yeah. Um, You know, but I would urge everybody, you know, look into Advanced Hunters Education. See if you can find it, if it's provided. If it's not go become a hunter's education instructor and then get into it and then make it an asset for Mm -hmm. everybody else that's coming after you. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many ways to be of service and be available to the hunting public and passing along, you know, one of the oldest traditions in the history of the planet. You know, I mean, hunting has been around since, you know, we could probably figure out how to kill an animal. Yeah. You know, so it's, yeah. Yeah. I feel like I've, I've I've always thought about that. I think I would like to get into get into teaching hunters education just mm-hmm. because I remember my class that I took in California. It's like I it wasn't a bad experience, mm-hmm. but it's like I did the the online course and then I was supposed to take the follow up course, the four and, hour course. Yeah, and oh. then there was no real difference between either of the courses. They just slammed us all in the same room. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, it was just sitting there in the room watching these old guys they were really funny they were they're were nice uh but just these old guys literally reading bullet points word for word off of a powerpoint well and, that's, and it was painful unfortunately that's what it is though i mean and, and if you're signing up to do the online course your four-hour course is basically a crash course and everything that's going to be on that test for a refresher yeah. there's no in the field experience and that's what the traditional two day courses for right. There's in the field experience, you know, and stuff like that, or, um, at West coast archery, maybe it was 2019. Um, you know, I had the opportunity and we put on a, on a blood trailing course, Mm. uh, 
uh, with Advanced Hunters Education and California Department of Fish and Wildlife. They came out. They brought two dead pigs out. I remember Um, when you were posting about that. Yeah. And, you know, getting to have people come out to that event and all new hunters, no one had ever skinned an animal before. No one had ever ground quartered an animal before, figured out how to put it in a backpack and take it out, you know, like all that stuff, you know, and, and like we set it up. So, okay, boom, here we are. There's a pig right there. We had a 3d target set up and everybody pretended to shoot it. And then we went out and tried to find the blood trail and the blood trail led to a pig that we took back. If I remember correctly, or the pig might already been yeah. at the skinning spot, but you know, just learning those things is so valuable and you pick up so much information, you know, looking at, you know, how the blades of grass have moved or, you know, if a rock is out of place, you can't find tracks. I can't tell you like archery hunting my whole life and having killed more animals with my bow than with a rifle, <laughs> how many times and how important it is to be able to read sign on the ground, you know, cause like not every shot is going to be a perfect shot, no matter how many times you try. I mean, you take a 40 yard shot and that animal hears a string, it can duck, it can jump, it can mm-hmm. fucking leap forward. There's so many different uh, variables in the field while that arrow is in flight, depending on you know how far the shot is, that you can hit it back in the guts, you can hit it forward in the shoulder. And I've spent, I think my longest track that I've done on an animal that I shot myself was five or six hours. And, and, and I am like, bow and pack are off. I'm at the last spot of blood that I've marked with toilet paper or, you know, whatever. And I'm on my hands and knees and I am going from track to track to track to scuff mark to a white mark on the top of a rock to the next track to the next track. And 80 yards later, I find a drop of blood that's as big as the tip of my pinky, you know, and, and had to track that way. And, and that's, if I hadn't, learned and understood that there's no way that I would have ever even thought to do that. And maybe as a new hunter, I would have hit a wall and Mm -hmm. like, and I mean on that particular track, I think the deer had only gone like maybe as a crow flies 500 yards, (laughs) you know, it hadn't gone that far, but the track, I mean a hundred yards on your hands and knees crawling through the brush is, you know, that's, that's a long ways to go. And I literally came up on a berm, on a natural berm, and lost all sign, and I couldn't find anything. And the deer was 15 yards to my right, piled up behind a stump. Oh, man. And, and, it was, and there it was, you know. But, I mean, for somebody else, that could have been the point of giving up, you know, and being like, well, maybe it's still alive and going to be okay and everything's fine and dandy and all that and you know i'd say nine times out of ten that's probably not the case you know there's a dead animal out there somewhere yeah you know and in california we don't have magpies to help us yeah it's i've definitely been on a few that was one of the things i I realized i was uh, out in texas hunting hogs Mm -hmm. and uh there's a couple of times i nailed one and i mean we spent three hours something like that looking except for like a little bit right where it right where it got hit mm-hmm. couldn't find a, a blessed thing and we saw it you know we we saw it kind of walk over into this other little opening in the trees it wobbled like it was about to fall over we're like holy shit cool, all we're right good. we're good yeah and and it kind of teetered off into the shadows and then we never saw it again and then later that week nailed another one and we spent gosh i mean i couldn't even tell you like it was over a mile tracking mm-hmm. that thing and it was the same kind of thing i'd i'd mark you know i'd mark last blood and then we'd get on our hands and knees and look for a track to point us in the right direction and we'd find i mean not even the size of your pinky like mm-hmm. just one little drop of blood that you know and i mean we tracked that thing basically until our flashlights were dead and never it, found it never never found it yeah especially with those pigs those things will close up so dang quick you can oh, have so a, much fat on a pig yeah yeah you can have this giant spray right when you start and then you know after about fat freaking just mushes together and coagulates 20 blood. yards it's all yeah oh man but yeah that tracking that's critical and i think that's a 
big lesson for people to learn is, you know, I think I've probably talked to, I mean, actually, I'm not sure if I've talked about this on the podcast, but it's like, you know, how, how long do you look for an animal? How long do you look for sign? You know what? Uh, and I don't think there's a, definite answer to that yeah i mean i wouldn't say that there is i know for me i'll look for the remainder of of the day that i'm looking like my first day and then i'll look the second day and i've 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 never not recovered an animal Mm -hmm. so i've always ended up finding them at some point in, in the in that time period I don't think I've ever gone to a second day. God, I'll probably hate myself for saying that because it'll happen at some fucking point. But I, I think you, you have to just take into account, you have to stop and be able to look at yourself in the mirror and say, yeah, I did everything I possibly could oh, yeah. to find that animal. Yeah. And then, I mean, at that point, you know, it's up to you and what the state laws are and everything like that. And you either not your tag and. Mm-hmm. You know, start helping your buddies hunt or figure out what your next move is. And that's one thing. I had a buddy I was out uh, hunting pronghorn with him. And uh, he, I mean, we were hunting hard as shit. Like it was down in Arizona. Um, he had the, he had a, I had a mule deer tag, he had a pronghorn tag. And we were kind of hunting together. And I mean, I mean, we were there for two weeks and just hammering away, hammering away, hammering away. Just could not get in on him. Finally, get we get him in on this big one. It's just me and him. And he nails it. And I, I can't remember. If it, he gouged it shoulder mm-hmm. pretty bad. And finally, and um, he's like, that's it. I'm calling it probably still alive, but I shot an animal. So I'm not to my tag. And I was like, okay. Commendable, man. I, I admire that. Yeah. Um, and everybody's got their own way of dealing with yeah. it, you know, and, and I'm not, going to sit on any sort of soapbox and say one way is better than the other you know it's personal preference and and what the individual decides to do and you know if there's consequences to the actions and they're willing to deal with their consequences then that's it is what it is you know yeah i think it's just it's about i mean as long as you're following the law Mm -hmm. that's i mean that's the critical thing yeah out of everything else like Follow the law. Yeah. You know, make sure, okay, yeah, if, uh, depending on every state's different. So depending on what your state says, if you are not doing what that state says, you're not being ethical. Yeah. But then, yeah, just make sure you're going to be able to look at yourself in the mirror or make sure that if you go do go kill another animal after that, it's not going to, you're not going to sit there the whole time and regret what you did after you t- kill that second animal. Thinking about that first one, you're like, mm-hmm. I probably killed that first one too. And like you're going to take away all your joy of the hunt. You're going to take away, you know, when you're eating that meat later, you're going to take away that experience of the story because mm-hmm. it's going to be soured from then on. So yeah. I think it's, and back to the flip flop. I go. mean, one of the best things at the flip flop is being able to tell the story of the mm-hmm. animal that you're cooking, mm-hmm. you know, and sharing the highs and lows of the hunt. I mean, that's one of, you know, that's one of my favorite things is like, Especially like when you kind of surprise someone and don't tell them it's wild game meat until afterwards. Oh, I mean, yeah. you can't quite do that with the flip flop. Oh yeah, you can. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah, you can. I mean, just let them think it's a cow leg or something, <sighs> calf, something veal. Who knows? But uh, I mean, I've had vegans and vegetarians walk up and be like, "Okay, I got to try this." Everybody's <laughs> talking about it too much. I don't eat meat, but you know, because you killed this yourself, and I agree with that, I will give this a shot and. Uh, I mean, there was one time I was cooking for um, a couple folks that were on the board of whatever at UC Berkeley, and it was a apple cider event. I think we were picking fresh apples mm. from a from an apple orchard and making apple cider for the day, and then you know eating uh, cheese plates and you know what charcuterie, charcuterie, and- yeah. And I pulled out this deer leg. And it was a black tail leg. And these folks looked at me like I was a saint. And, <laughs> you know, only three of them were willing to try it. But by the end of that event, every single person at that event tried it, came back for seconds and wanted more. Hell yeah. And absolutely loved it. And for me, that's like one of the most beautiful parts is watching it change people's honest opinion of hunting and what hunting provides. You know, and that's so cool to see that light turn on when you can, when you can 
serve somebody wild game that's better than anything they've ever had in their life and change their opinion about hunting and what it actually brings to the table is amazing. Right. And that, that is going to be our saving grace as hunters is being able to make the connection through food to other folks that are on the fence that don't hunt, you know what I mean? Or whatever. Um, and changing their minds and getting them to want to hunt because they want to do their own flip flop. Oh, without a doubt, <laughs> without a doubt. I'm, I'm still thinking about that white tail leg in the freezer. I'm like 24 hour thought time. Yeah. I could get home and do that for dinner this morning. Yeah. I don't know. I got the family. So I got the family coming out oh. this, uh, next week. Yeah. They're going to be here for the whole week. Um, and it's like the whole family's coming out. How many folks? Uh, my parents, I've got my brother and sister-in-law and their two boys. And then I've got my sister and brother-in-law and two of the three of them. So there's 10 of them coming out. Mm-hmm. Uh, my folks will probably stay with me at my place in my guest room. And then uh, everyone, and then they got an Airbnb around the corner in Belgrade. And oh, cool. definitely going to take them around and, uh, uh, you know, we'll do some grilling at the place, but I'll, you know, take them around. We're going to try and do some fly fishing that I'm actually scrambling to figure out right now how to get effectively eight people fly fishing. Most of whom have never fly fished before. I'll take like four or five boats, something, figure something out. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, and I kind of figured it'll be like my ne- a couple of my, ne- my, my youngest nephews will do a few casts. They'll be like, okay, that's what fly fishing is. Now give them a, a spin reel and, mm-hmm. and just let them drop something in the water. Yeah. But um, it'll be, it'll be, it'll be interesting. But yeah, got the whole family coming out. Might have to do a little, uh, do a little flip flop with them. Maybe yeah. give, it a, give it a try. Um, I'll have to order me some flip flop sauce. Yeah. But uh, if you want to, let me know. Uh, if you're going to do one, I can walk you through it. Nice. For I, next week, get your neighbors involved and. You know, get about 20 people and you guys would crush that leg like nobody's business. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, knowing my nephews, they could probably crush it. <laughs> they themselves. could probably crush 20 people's worth of meat. Yeah. I remember I made I made some uh, backstrap one time for Christmas dinner. And some about like when you cook up that backstrap, especially if you do it like really with like a really rich marinade, like that fills mm-hmm. you up quick, like oh, surprisingly. Because yeah. that's some like that's some dense meat. Oh yeah. And, uh, they hammered, I like, they hammered that so quick. Like I was afraid there was going to be no leftovers for me later and I was going to get really butt hurt. But, uh, yeah, so I would not be surprised, but I'm sure the neighbors will come out, you know, and that's the cool thing about the birch barrel too, is, you know, the second that thing lights up, everyone's like hanging out around it with a, you know, with a soda or a beer and just ready to go and ready to go. Yeah. And it's perfect, uh, perfect grill for the flip flop, man. It works. Not at all sponsored by Birch Barrel, but I love those guys so yeah. much. I pimp them on like Everything one out of five can. podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> People are probably like, for the love of God, is he talking about the Birch Barrel again? Yeah. Roby's got a really great story and he's he's done such a phenomenal way of of product development mm-hmm. and going through the highs and the lows of it and mm-hmm. figuring out what works. And the product that he's developed is, you know, and top tier of all charcoal grills, you know, and there's no, oh, yeah. there's no question in my mind about that. You know, it is, I mean, shit, they just got on Forbes, Forbes list for, Did they? for nice. barbecue grills. They were in uh, something else, Bozeman Gazette, maybe about being, you know, a fast yeah. growing, uh, startup company. Uh, they're crushing it. They're doing so great. And they, they just come out with that V2. Yeah, the V2 that is great. It's legit. Yeah, I'll be cooking on that tomorrow at, at that private event that I'm cooking for, and I'm excited. Heck yeah, man. Well, I am, I'm freaking stoked to have you here in Bozeman. Hey, Bozeman. And, uh, Fuck. dear Lord, what are we, <laughs> who just let the Californians into Montana? Not the honestly. Montanans. <laughs> for damn sure. Uh, yeah, I, I always tell people they They'll make a comment about California. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. My driver's license says Montana, so mm-hmm. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Yeah. Hopefully soon my plates will, but we've had that discussion. Yeah. Um, awesome, man. So, all right, winding it down. So if somebody, uh, you know, say you're to flip-flop with someone and they're like, oh, man, this like wild game, 
this is so cool, man. I've always wanted to like go out and hunt my own deer, my own elk and, and, you know, be able to bring something home like this. But I don't know. There's, there's a lot of shit to learn. Like, I don't know if this is something I could do. Mm -hmm. Um, what would you, what inspiration words, poetic words of wisdom would you give, give that person? Buy a leg off my website. (laughs) (laughs) No. Uh, if somebody was wanting to get into hunting, I mean, I would encourage them 100%, you know, and I would explain to them the reality of hunting and the fact that you are taking a life and you are killing an animal and there is process behind that and there is reward behind that. And there's a lot of other emotions that get wrapped up into the kill of an animal. Even for me, every time I take a life, I'm taking a life that's serious, you know? Um, and I definitely get into that aspect of it with them. And I'd also get into the communal aspect and, you know, where I have found my church is in the wilderness, you know, and I've never been a, you know, devout religious guy or, you know, anything like that. I mean, I've gone to church here and there, like I've got a King James Bible, but like, you know, by no means am I a religious man, you know, 100%. Like, um, but nature is my church. I find my best thoughts, my best headspace, um, my best everything comes out of time in the wilderness. And hunting provides me purpose for being in the wilderness more than just going on a hike. Um, it puts meat on my table. It feeds my friends. It feeds people that have never had wild game, which feeding people that have never had wild game, exquisite wild game meals, you know, is, is what my life is all about, which is converting more people into becoming hunters. So, yeah, I mean, I would, I would let them know there's states where you can get tags every year. The, the success rate might be 3%. You know, or it might be 7% or 15%, which means you have to work 90% harder than every other person that's out there hunting, you know, in order to, to gain that success. You know, one of my buddies, Kyle, uh, Kyle Sibley in California, he does Sibley Skull Works. Uh, he always says, and it's so great when he says it, he always says 10% kill 90%. You know what I mean? And I, mm-hmm. fu- I fully believe that 10% of hunters kill 90% of the deer. And I bet you it's that same 10% every year they kill 90% of the deer. Um, but to get to that step, you know, it's like you go to the gym, man, you ain't, you're not picking up 315 pounds or 325 pounds the first time you're picking up that barbell. Yeah. You know, you go onto a moto track, you're not hitting fast laps, you know, for a year or something like, you know what I mean? Like it takes time, it takes dedication, it takes devotion, you know, but the reward at the end of all of that is so much greater than any reward I've ever had in my entire life for anything, you know? So I don't know if that's poetry. I sounded like some damn good poetry to me. (laughs) (laughs) On that note, man, I'm glad we finally got to sit down. Only took us a few, few years, a few years, mostly my fault. Admittedly. Uh Um, I'm a slacker. I get caught up in shit, but life happens, man. Hey, and, uh, we'll definitely in, in the the few blinks you're here, we'll definitely have to, uh, have to get some, something on the grill. Let, let you reap the benefits of the flip flop sometime Mm. rather than uh, being the guy working. Yeah, it's it's interesting. <laughs> I don't eat. It's much. like it's like sitting. It's like almost sitting in the passenger seat of your own car. Yeah, it's got to be like, okay, I can do this, but it's kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. For sure. Yeah. And if if anybody's trying to find it, it's on Instagram. It's just the flip flop guy. Um, the website again is www.theflipflopguy.co. If you're interested in a you know good. Uh, video about our story it's on our website under our story and you can kind of read about my grandfather and my family and and everybody else um you know check it out enjoy it and if you buy some sauce let me know how i can help if you have any questions feel free to shoot me a message and i'll do anything i can to help oh yeah man glad we got to sit down yeah All right, y'all, that'll do it for this episode of The Wild Initiative. Make sure to check out the show notes page at thewildinitiative.com. Get links to everything we talked about in today's episode. That'll do it for this week. Looking forward to next time. But until then, I hope this episode inspired you to get involved, get outdoors, and plan your initiative for the wild. 
Thank you for listening to the Wild Initiative. Please take a moment to leave a rating and review on iTunes or Stitcher and head on over to thewildinitiative.com to get show notes, check out the blog, gear discounts, other podcasts from the Wild Initiative family, and more. And I'll get down to the ball joint. Hold on. Oh, gross. Hopefully they cut that out. Um, <laughs> we'll make sure to add that in in the bloopers at the end. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's so funny.